In this lecture, we'll be taking a look at how sociologists use and apply the term deviance. From there, we will expand it to a more codified reaction to deviant behavior in the form of crime and the legal system, or even criminal law. And then from there, we'll move over to look at how social control fits into the interplay between uh, norms and, in this case, communal norms, and human behavior. Uh, at this point in the lecture, we will engage the term stigma, and we'll frame it in a way that is very similar uh, to how it was used and applied by sociologist Irving Goffman. Deviance, in this case, refers to any sort of violation of communal norms, or what uh, is believed to be uh, normative behavior. Uh, we see the infraction uh, of, in this case, uh, a normative behavior as being sometimes minor. Um, this could be something uh, as minuscule as how a person wears their hair, or if they are driving a few miles over the speed limit. But then we see infractions which are major, and these would include things like uh, the taking of a life, uh, murder in this case, or theft. Sociologist Howard Becker, uh, writing um, in the 1960s, addressed this concept of deviance, and he recognized uh, that deviance, um, in terms of being an act, uh, is uh, not only the act of uh, violating a norm, but it is also the corresponding reaction to that deviant action. So there's both a a cause and effect in terms of how sociologists are looking at uh, deviance and deviant behavior. Of course, this becomes greatly expanded um, and it expands even in scale, uh, reaching the state level, when we start looking more closely at um, crime uh, as a codified um, label, in a sense, for a deviant act or for uh, individual deviance. Now what's interesting about this is that um, the principle that, uh, in this case, Howard Becker is laying out for us is something that is uh, societal in nature. Um, and in many respects, when we are looking either through the lens of sociology or the lens of anthropology at deviance, what we immediately realize is that there are universal qualities to how a community at least reacts to a deviant behavior. So although most societies, most cultures in a sense, uh, would not engage deviance or even define it uh, in the same manner, um, a very good, very historical example would be how the Yanomami, uh, studied by, uh, in this case, uh, Shagnon, the anthropologist, um, how they perceived murder, or what we would categorize as murder, uh, they perceived it as uh, basically, uh, you know, an everyday occurrence, whereas for us it's an extreme, um, life-altering um, kind of behavior. The If in both of these cultures the community was to label that act as being deviant, then there would be consequences, um, sometimes major, sometimes minor. Uh, and so the reaction to a deviant behavior is universal, whereas the definition of a deviant behavior may be much more local, maybe in, even individual in some instances. So as a result, when a sociologist, when an anthropologist looks at and frames deviance, they are doing so in a multicultural manner. They look at cultures as both uh, historical, uh, as particulate, um, as local expressions of human psychology. They look at the surrounding society, the physical manifestation of culture as being very much local and the actions of people within that society as being very much local. They do so in a non-judgmental way. But then when they take a look at the reaction to a deviant behavior, 
they realize that the concept of a consequence, uh, the concept of a stigma, um, the concept of positive and negative reactions uh, in the form of social control, um, and they look at uh, how those reactions are sometimes incorporated into larger mechanisms of social order, they look at those as being much more universal, that the reaction does occur. Now when these universal reactions begin to take effect, and when we start to see reactions being incorporated into systems of social control, we are gradually moving into an area, at least when we're in a state-level society, of addressing the notion of crime. So crime, in a sense, is considered to be the violation of a, of a rule, often a written rule, something that is codified. Uh, in the extreme, it is going to be ultimately an act that will be understood on a group or society-wide level. Uh, in a more minor expression, it is something that is experienced uh, on an individual level. And again, I think, as I mentioned before, if we were to consider a person driving over the speed limit as being a minor infraction that can be and is codified as criminal, uh, that is uh, very different than if we have an individual who takes another person's life, and that is more extreme. Uh, an, an extreme reaction to it, an extreme negative reaction to it, would of course be uh, something like the death penalty, right? If that is, a, again, a law of the land, something that is codified uh, with regard to reacting to a crime. So to be a crime and to understand criminal activity as a kind of deviant behavior, we have to understand something about its context. And so, you know, being in a state level political structure is very important. Having uh, something like judgment, but on a community, well, group or community wide level, that is also something that uh, a sociologist looks for. And then when we start to see another sociological concept like stigma start to take shape and spread across larger social units. This can also be something where we start to see criminal activity uh, being observed. Now a stigma is something that you and I, when we engage the word, are thinking more intimately about it. Uh, it's, it's something much more individual in nature. However, as sociologists engage and use the concept of, of a stigma, uh, again, much in much the same manner as how Irving Goffman in the early 1960s applied the term, this is something that is much more communal, much more um, a part of a society and how it's structured and how it functions. So in this case, uh, a stigma is something uh, that is uh, associated with characteristics that are used to discredit people, uh, to devalue individuals. So when I engage in a particular kind of behavior and it depreciates my overall social, economic, or political worth, that behavior and the reaction to it, if it has that kind of impact, can be classified and categorized within this sociological concept of a stigma. Now what's interesting about the concept of a stigma is that it is also something that we can look at as uh, immoral. Uh, a stigma can incorporate qualities of a person's life, qualities of their demeanor, qualities of their appearance, qualities of their place within a society as grounds for discrimination. When a stigma accomplishes that level, when it um, is being utilized by people, 
uh, to discredit others, then it now becomes an abhorrent, dangerous concept. How we are going to apply the concept of stigma is going to be much different than that. Stigmas, in this case, are going to be associated with uh, historical conduct. Uh, they will be directly relatable to a criminal act or criminal activity, or they will relate to the violation of a social norm. So that brings us to the next major concept that we have to more deeply understand, again, from a sociological perspective, uh, and that is the concept of, of social norms. Now, sociologists will tell you right off the bat, and I would say that the majority of anthropologists, at least cultural anthropologists, who deal with this kind of uh, behavioral uh, model and uh, theorization, uh, what they will tell you right away is that no group or society can really exist without rules of behavior, um, standards that are, in a sense, understood as predictable, as irreplaceable, as and as uh, nearly immovable in nature. Even though we know that social norms will change over time. Uh, in your lifetime, you have seen uh, quite a bit of change with regard to the arts. You have uh, recognized quite a bit of change with regard to uh, what we perceive to be um, uh, expressive culture, things like music. You have seen laws change. You have seen, in this case, the perspectives of a society regarding particular qualities of life as changing over time. So norms are flexible. However, by definition, a society within a specific moment in time will recognize norms to be nearly inflexible. Uh, they become standards uh, for what we expect of others, what we expect of others and their role within a society, and what we ultimately expect with regard to how social institutions within a society, how they function. So how a sociologist looks at the concept of a norm of or of normative behavior in a sense will be very static in nature. However, as we step back and we change the scale of our perspective, as we start to look at uh, social norms through the lens of history, specifically social history, we start to realize that these are extremely flexible, that they are highly adaptive, and that not only their, their inflexible nature in the moment, but their large scale, flexible, adaptable quality help the concept of the norm to be foundational to how a society persists, how it will survive over time. If we're unable to adapt with regard to codes of conduct, with regard to rules of behavior that govern everything that we do, in a sense, if we can't adapt, then we will fail. It is our ability to adapt to changing perspectives, to changing environmental needs, um, that help us to ultimately survive as a human society. So a sociologist looking at norms will say, well, without norms, we would have social chaos. Norms, as a sociologist would also say, are going to, in a sense, lay the groundwork for how the society functions. The role that you play as a son, as a daughter, as a mother, as a father, as a police officer, as a firefighter, as a lawyer, as a doctor, so on and so forth. All of these roles in a sense, and how you within that role, acting within that role, are interacting with others. This is the, the core 
to how a social norm functions and how it staves off, in a sense, uh, this notion of chaos, of a, of a lack of social order. And as I said before, the roles that people play uh, as they fulfill normative behavior, things that are expected, things that are almost predictable in nature, the roles that people will fulfill, the roles that they will play, will generally fit into three major categories. And these categories are how an anthropologist, how a sociologist ultimately categorize and classify all of the behaviors occurring within a group, within a society. And they fit into social institutions or a social category. They fit into a political category. And they also fit into an economic category. And so within each of these major categories, there are roles, there are role players. You can persist in and throughout all three of those categories. You can generally exist within one category or two categories, but ultimately all of our behaviors, all of those behaviors that help us to, in a sense, fit in to the structure of a society, can be in some way, shape, or form classified or categorized into one of these areas. Now, when we're looking at crime as an expression of deviant behavior, uh, crime being deviant behavior, again, that is in some way, shape, or form codified by a larger social uh, unit, when that behavior, in a sense, and the reaction to that behavior help to structure the society or maintain its structure, we apply another concept. And the concept that we're applying here is going to be the, the concept of social order. And there's another concept that kind of ties very closely to that, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. So when we really look at it, norms and the expectations that surround them, these rules of behavior that are governing everything that we do and that we, in a sense, expect, what these do is they bring about social order. They, in a sense, establish and maintain the structure of a society, uh, the uh, arrangements between role players, uh, the expectations that we who are not acting in a particular role have for the individual that is fulfilling that role in some way, shape, or form. And what's really powerful about this is that social order, as it relates to, uh, in this case, uh, the customs uh, of behavior or the expectations that we have for specific role players, what this in a sense is doing is this is maintaining our lives. Um, and it maintains in a sense our position with which within the larger society. So deviance then uh, in relation to the concept of social order is something that will ultimately undermine or destroy or threaten, in a sense, I, I guess would be a better way of looking at it. It would be a threat to social order. And that's where we start to see um, major and, and minor um, reactions to deviance being codified or being part of the social fabric, something that is written into law. You shall not behave this way, right? Because we believe as a group, as a society, that if you behave in that manner, it threatens the core of who we are. It threatens uh, our social order. It, it threatens the structure of our society. It, it threatens, in a sense, what weaves our society together and maintains that cohesiveness that is extremely important. And People like Max Weber, which we'll be talking about quite a bit throughout the course, um, also people like Emil Durkheim, they really focused in on what mechanisms exist within a society uh, that help to maintain the social order, 
they emphasize the importance of social order as structuring the society and maintaining the society because they believed, as many sociologists today and in the past do or have, that if there is a violation to the social order that is extreme in nature and it is not reacted to or addressed by the group, by the society, by the community, then that becomes something that inherently will lead to the collapse of that group. We can no longer define who we are. We no longer understand group membership. We can't maintain group membership. Right. So the idea of social order is another major factor when we're trying to understand how a sociologist engages deviance or deviant behavior. Now Max Weber, who is another very important foundational individual um, in the discipline of sociology, focused very strongly on the concept of social control, how we are maintaining, in a sense, social order through the reaction on a society-wide level that we are having to the violation of a norm, or uh, how we, we are reacting to, in this case, uh, a deviant behavior uh, of, of a major infraction, or to, I guess, uh, a lesser extent, a, a minor infraction as well. He recognized uh, things like religion, and he recognized things like the state, uh, with its codified laws, as being what maintains social control. Right? The ideas that we have regarding right and wrong, the ideas that we have regarding individual conduct, and how we engage those ideas and maintain those standards, these are things that Weber saw as being important to how we maintain social order and ultimately how we tie the idea of deviance, the idea of social order, to something like social control. So uh, one of the things that he really focuses in on uh, in, in a variety of social institutions, um, things that are social, things that are political, things that are economic, he really focuses in on this idea of the continual threat of force, that we have this kind of looming, almost police state that exists within a society, where you feel that if you are going to violate a norm, that there will be an immediate consequence and that this is a constant threat that you are living under. He really recognized this to be um, the means by which a state-level society maintains its order. And he saw it as being very, very effective. Let's face it, when you're driving down the road uh, in one lane, there are painted lines on either side of your car, and those painted lines, in a sense, are symbols. And they are symbols of social norms. We cannot, in a sense, swerve into another lane. We have the ability to do that, but according to the rules of conduct, which are codified in law, in the law of our society, we are, in a sense, disallowed from doing that. And it's that continual threat of force that prevents us from swerving into the other lane. Now, I know there are exceptions to those rules. If uh, an animal runs out in front of the car, um, if there is some sort of uh, natural disaster, so on and so forth, of course, you can come up with a thousand and one different exceptions to the rule. But what I really want to focus on here is that line on either side of the car that is representing the consequence of violating a rule. Right? Just like the sign that exists on the side of the road that says uh, the speed limit is 55, right? You can travel at any speed you want. However, the sign reminds you that if you violate that norm, there will be a consequence and it will be legal in nature. And that's, again, what Max Weber in his writings really is focusing in on. And he's looking for the mechanisms within a society that maintain that social order, the symbols within a society that are empowered, 
uh, through religion, through economic activity and expectations. Uh, reciprocity would be a very good example of that uh, in a cash, uh, uh, cash economy. Um, political uh, institutions, political uh, mechanisms that are at work, uh, due process, uh, both politically and in a uh, legal setting. These are things that, according to this Weberian perspective, are things that, they're symbols that help to maintain the social order, and they represent in their, their being, their makeup, uh, they represent a form of social control. And it is in the sanctions, right, the expressions of disapproval, that ultimately the social control is empowered. And so we recognize, again, two major camps, and this is very logical when you think about it. You have negative sanctions, uh, everything from a person looking at you with a stern face to imprisonment. That would be a negative sanction. Uh, and then we have positive sanctions. Uh, this can be a smile, a pat on the back. This can be uh, more money in your paycheck, right? And it's these kinds of sanctions that are empowering mechanisms of social control and are indirectly maintaining, in this case, social order. So when we step back and look at everything that has been discussed in this lecture, we realize that, in a sense, deviance, as it is engaged by a sociologist on a practical and a theoretical level, this refers to any sort of violation of a social rule. And the social rule is something that is knit into the fabric of even how you perceive the world around you. So it has a, a kind of a psychological quality to it as well. Many people would say, and I would agree with them, that the concept of culture is very psychological in nature, right? It's, it's the rules, the rules of behavior, it's the experience, the history that lives inside of your cognition. Whereas things that are social are things that are directly observable. The outcome of what that psychology is guiding you through. So these social rules, in a sense, if they are violated, help us to define what deviance is. And it can occur on many different levels. The term, uh, as, a, as a sociologist looks at it, is not something that is judgmental in nature. Uh, it is merely how we further classify and organize and study human behavior. We also realize that deviance, in a sense, is not something that is universal, uh, but something that is much more relative, uh, much more local. Uh, it varies from group to group. It varies from community to community. It varies from society to society. However, that there is some sort of reaction to it, that appears to be what is ultimately uh, a universal quality. So to understand deviance, we must first understand something about its context. We have to understand something about the group, the society that defines it, that engages it, that interacts with it. Um, deviance, by its nature, will have uh, unwritten rules regarding how we react to it. But when it moves to the level of a crime, these rules are written. They, they are codified in nature. And then lastly, there is the psychology behind deviance. And so I want to touch a little bit upon that before we move on and, and look strictly within a, a criminological environment. I should also mention, however, psychology in this case also plays another role. Uh, psychological perspectives as they are engaged uh, by sociologists and embraced by sociologists help us to better understand something about the source of deviance. Um, this give and take between the environment and what some believe, some sociobiologists believe to be genetic dispositions toward uh, particular kinds of behaviors, both positive and negative in nature.
throughout the rather lengthy history of criminological theory and criminological thought, the idea or the notion of genetic predispositions uh, have been things that have been tested, that have been rejected, and then retested uh, over time. Uh, the notion that uh, there is something biological uh, or a biological basis to deviance, uh, something that will lead people to a deviant act. Uh, this is something that we see quite a bit, discussed rather, quite a bit uh, in topics relating to juvenile delinquency and crime. Uh, and you will find people on both sides of the argument. But what I think you'll find when you step back and look at the argument holistically is that there are environmental cues, there are uh, social structural qualities uh, that contribute to deviance, and then there are uh, biological components to deviant behaviors as well, because the more we study of the human genome, the more we realize that uh, behavior is a part of the equation. It's not the equation, but it's definitely a part of it. So when we start to take a look at studies of street crime, um, the frequencies of street crime, uh, the people who partake in this particular kind of criminal act or deviant behavior, all of these things uh, we start to see um, issues of uh, personality, personality disorders, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, human biology. Psychologists will often focus on, in this case, uh, abnormalities uh, as they relate to thought. Uh, and as I said previously, personality disorders seem to be the kind of chief area of interest for psychologists and how they engage and ultimately explain uh, deviance and deviant behaviors. Now, as I said before, again, not everyone agrees with this biological basis or that biology has a significant role to play in deviant behavior. Um, a good example of somebody who is, through their research, very much pushing back against um, biology and personality as a means of understanding, classifying, categorizing, and even predicting uh, deviant behavior is Edwin Sutherland. Now Sutherland uh, begins his writings in the 1920s uh, and he focuses on uh, a concept now known as differential association when he's describing how a deviant act begins and how it operates on a psychological level. For Sutherland and others who are actively pushing against biology and personality, the idea of deviance is something that is attributable to a learned behavior. According to Sutherland and others, and this ties into the concept of differential association, we learn to deviate from a societal norm, or we learn uh, or we witness people around us actively modeling behaviors that do not conform to a society's norm. And so this, again, is something that uh, Sutherland focuses on when he's looking at uh, the, the source of a criminal act or where it starts on a psychological basis. This is something that has been patterned for us. So the idea here is that generally your choice not to conform to a society's norm is primarily coming from different groups that and individuals within those groups that you are associating with. So uh, the way we can look at this uh, through Sutherland's uh, lens for a moment is gang activity. So you may have a boy or a girl who joins a street gang you may juxtapose his or her uh, activities uh, and uh, their behavioral history to maybe another boy or girl that has joined um, the scouts, right? And you 
recognize that in one instance we have associations that are paving the way for more deviant behaviors and in another association we are starting to see uh, an organization that again through role play is actively instructing or socializing uh, the young person into uh, behaviors that uh, will conform to a society's norms. Now this is a kind of a, a simple example and, and something that's a little bit extreme, um, but ultimately that's that's what Sutherland is getting at uh, in in or with regard to this notion of differential association is it's the associations that you are making as you are growing and developing a more rational mind as a young person and uh, and this of course will continue on throughout life it's these associations and how they vary over time that will contribute to your behaviors and some of these behaviors may end up being things that are by their nature deviant